Welcome to Bloomberg Bottom Line from the headquarters. And we have a special show for you because we're coming live from the Relige massive offices in, in uh, Greater Noida where a lot of the, uh, the establishment sits out here for Relige. It is a big uh, financial behemoth nowadays with a large footprint outside the country. And we have the top brass of Relige joining us today. First up is Shachindra Nath, who is the group CEO of Relige. Shachindra, great to have you with us. Thank you so much for hosting us out here. Thank Interesting you. times we live in. And of course, uh, we were just discussing about uh, the sheer scale of Relige's operations. So I've got a lot of questions for you. I want to start off with your sense on the economy, because you are lending uh, largely to SMEs. What's the state of the economy from, from uh, their standpoint? Yeah, so thank, thanks for all the compliment. I think the scale is a relative term. We still feel <laughs> we are very small as a business, uh, because there are a lot many much larger and more successful players. But having said that, I think so this, the, where, the, how we look at about this economy and what we are seeing on ground presence in terms of, especially our SME lending business, actually we feel more comfortable uh, and the way the things are shaping up and how the markets are growing. Uh, there's a lot of skepticism in the market in terms of the pace of reform, how things are changing. Sure. But we have always believed that this is a slow process. Uh, what we believe, because we also deal with the corporate sector through our investment bank and others, what we think that India Inc. per se is still is a lot more trouble. Uh, its balance sheet is still far more stretched. Banks are still under tremendous pressure and trouble. But the small and medium enterprises are fairly doing well, especially the businesses which are in logistics, consumer sector. They are all seeing the uptake. It's the e-commerce effect, right, on the logistics. To and, and absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I, I think that there's a lot of activity, yes. but the traditional view is that SME is worse off. Because look at the export figures that we have seen, and manufacturing is slow, ancillary companies are in trouble. What's the sense from that end? Yeah, so we are not seeing that, honestly. So we have not been very strong in terms of SME which are involved in a lot of export businesses. Uh, because those businesses are very cyclical and they are get affected very soon what is happening in global economies. But the SME sector which we do uh, are all getting benefited. All of their orders are, are growing. So what is happening that most of them are now getting to new capacity creation and that's why they are borrowing at the entrepreneur level. Uh, and they are now increasing their base in terms of their revenue. Uh, some of the sector which we are involved, especially we do a large amount of financing for education. Uh, that is a very fast-growing sector. Most of the educational institutes which we lend to are now increasing the capacity, especially in the medical and engineering sector. And that happens when people have this feel that the capacity increase would finally turn into because there's a lot of inflow which is Fair coming. Enough. IT is fairly doing well. So a lot of people who are supplied to IT and IT ancillaries, auto ancillaries are started doing very well. So most of the sectors, there are certain negative sectors which we don't lend to or we are still conservative, so we don't still do infra ancillary, we don't do very small chemical related businesses, but otherwise generally sector is okay. doing well. You know, the big uh, sentiment boost has been after that 50 bips cut by the RBI on the rates. Um, how long before cost of capital comes down and how long before this really eggs on investment from some of these uh, companies that are growing rapidly? Yeah, I think the bigger boost was the transmission that finally banks have actually transferred sure. that cut because before that also you have four cuts and nothing got transmitted. Look, my personal belief is, and I tend to what governor says, that when people decide to do capital expenditure, and 50 basis point doesn't make any difference. It's sometimes it's just an enabler when you know you have more positivity around it. What it definitely helps, it helps banks balance sheet to get strengthened because you have no more earnings coming in because there's always a transmission loss. Second, I think so the market becomes far more attractive because the spread for global investor in debt market becomes very attractive. Uh, and liquidity is a driver of, uh, of most of the things generally because when the fundamentals taking time, liquidity uh, tend to, uh, to drive things. Sure. So this rate cut has made India as a market much more attractive than anywhere else. But I think so that we are now, as everyone has said, that India Inc. has to now do 
and take more call in terms of creating capacity. Okay. We are in the midst of uh, earning se season, Shachindra, uh, and it's not been a pretty picture. Some of the big guys have, of course, Reliance is doing very well today. It's, uh, the stock is up sharply on the back of the numbers. But what sense are you getting from corporate results? How long before a real recovery starts, and which are the sectors where you think there is recovery? I would say that we are still three quarters to four quarters away from a real recovery. The reason for that, if you look at where the major boost can come up, it can come from infra, real estate. IT has been doing fairly okay, but the IT is also dependent upon how global economies are doing and where people are spending the money or not. They're hard, because we are still not a large manufacturing economy. So uh, my sense is that capital expenditure uh, from the guys who are coming from outside and pumping in capital, mm -hmm. that would boost the economy. And some level of balance sheet impairment and re refinancing the balance sheets of large guys so would still help there. three to four quarters away, I would actual say so. corporate recovery and investment. Yes. Okay. I've got a couple of questions because when I said scale, it was what was interesting about Redigare is the, is the footprint you have internationally, and that gives you a, a, a year close to the ground, so to yep. say, when it comes to institutional investors. I'm going to talk about the AMC side first. Yep. You have a lot of big pension funds, institutional investors who, uh, you know, uh, root their investments through you. What's the interest level on India right now? Yeah. So look, uh, so we manage roughly around $24 billion of asset under management largely on the alternator private equity side. For the first time uh, in, in last four years, uh, I have traveled very extensively. I've spent almost 20 days in the US uh, just last month itself. For the first time after Chinese crisis, people have tend to start looking India as a separate asset class. Mm. It has never happened before because we were part of emerging market. And it was like any other, so we're part of an emerging market allocation. For the first time, allocators of capital has started thinking whether they have to allocate capital for India separately. It has not happened yet for two reasons. I think so that domestically we are more negative about ourselves than than outsider and that overweights in terms of their thinking. So we should stop doing that. Number two, I think so currency is still is an is a big spoiler because people are still not their view around currency is still weak. They just don't know where it would tend to. Once these two things get stabilized, I think so you'll see huge flow okay. of capital. I want to uh, delve a little on currency. What is the worry on currency? After the devaluation of the yuan, are they worried that India will also allow the currency to weaken? What is the sense that you're getting? And how is that hurting <laughs> their investment profile on it? So there are two things. One, everyone knew that China controls currency and manages it. And finally, it couldn't hold it at that level, and that's why it has to devalue. India people know that it is in mix of the two. It, it sometimes manages its currency, sometimes doesn't manage its currency. And people generally don't know whether India has the fundamental strength which will appreciate or keep the currency stable. So while people look at the current account deficit number, fiscal deficit number, and are now comfortable with, but they are not taking that view that it would remain in that zone, which means the currency would remain stable. So once you see more quarterly number, more uh, more of that getting stability, currency would become stable automatically. So I just say, say it's a time okay. lag effect. So uh, do you see allocations increasing, more money coming in, more India-only long funds coming in? Because right now we've been clubbed with emerging markets. And after the sell-off, you've seen, and I'm going to talk to Gautam and Nitin about it later, but uh, what is the sense that you're getting? Is it going to be a better uh, end of the calendar year? I would say that we will still remain as where we are. We will still be part of emerging market allocation, but the, our weight in the EM would it get increased. And that gradually. would naturally mean more money. Mean coming. more money coming okay. to that. But what is more important? What most of people are very skeptical of make, of a, make in India campaign. But uh, my personal feel is that that has really created an impact. You will see more and more FDI money coming in, which is yeah. good for the economy, okay. than FI money. Shachindra, you were telling me you grew up in Banaras, so you're close to the Indian heartland. Uh, yeah. well, how are you reading the signs from the Bihar elections? Because that's the big one, and that's the worry right now for a lot of uh, equity market analysts. I don't know why people say that's a big one. I mean, it's in a state election, bro. Right? Yes, well, of course, what happens in the Rajasthan Yeah, I think so. And yes, reforms. Yes and no, both. But the uh, fact is that it has been made, so, so much of noise has been created, it's a big state, right? So for a central government which is trying to become a national party, winning there would sentimentally be very, very positive. So obviously you'll see a big uptick on the market. My gut feel is that what most of people don't realize is that India has dramatically changed across uh, every uh, segment of the society. A lot of people still believe that Bihar is still continue to be a caste math. My ground feel that the younger generation is no longer on the call, on the, that much of caste dynamic. 
So my feel is that you may see a surprise. It would okay. be a close fight, but it would be a but surprise. But if the government, uh, if the uh, BJP-led NDA doesn't win in uh, Bihar, how much of a setback is it to the reform agenda, to GST, to a whole lot of bills that are pending? And would the markets negatively react to something like Market that? Market would definitely negatively react. It would be, a, I think, so one quarter of bad, bad blood going on to the market. But the fact is that neither GST nor any of the reform has any big dent on the economy itself. I, it's our more noise about saying, oh, we are the boss and we will let, you, know, you have to run it through like us. Otherwise, it's all, I think so there is a lot of work which is happening, which is good work. And we have to just let it happen. Okay. We will leave it there, Shachinder. Thanks so much Thank for you joining so much. us. We head into a short break. On the other side, Gautam Trivedi, who is the head uh, and CEO of Relegate Capital Markets, will be joining us. We will talk sectors. We will talk about how the economy is poised and which are the stocks or, uh, or bets that uh, he's uh, advising to his clients. Do stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching uh, from the headquarters and we are at uh, the offices of Relegate here in New Delhi. Joining me now is Gautam Trivedi, uh, the head of the Relegate Capital Markets. Uh, Gautam, thanks so much for joining Thank us. You. Of course, you sit out of Mumbai, but uh, good to have you in Delhi out here. Uh, we're in the midst of earnings season. We've had yeah. two big numbers that the markets are reacting to today. One is, of course, reliance on the positive side yeah. because the numbers and the GRMs are great. And HCL Technologies, we knew that there was a problem over there, and I think IT, big IT has been a little mixed. Uh, yeah. I'm going to start off with HCL Technologies. Sure. What did you make of it, uh, and also what are the concerns on IT right now? I think the good news is, at least, in the, you know, the, 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 of course it's bad news, the results weren't great, but the good news is the company gave a warning, stock reacted to the warning itself before uh, a good 10 days prior to the results. So the reaction has therefore been muted in terms of the uh, numbers. And I think uh, from a valuation perspective, it's now, I think, uh, just under 13 times forward earnings uh, versus a TCS, which is still about 18 to 19 times. So I think people are starting to now look at this talk and find this, from a pure valuation perspective, quite interesting. Sure. So that's the feedback we've got this morning. Okay, great. Uh, <coughs> Reliance, great numbers, yeah. uh, huge, uh, you know, upside today. For that yeah. stock, I've been tracking it 2010 to now. It's not moved that's beyond right. 1,100 or 1,200. What's yeah. happening on that one? I mean, do you see that band continuing? You know, I think uh, this stock could suddenly break out. And the fact is, you're absolutely right. The stock hasn't really done much in the last five years. But the, but the company's been in a CapEx mode, right? Whether it's been retail, whether it's been now telecom. And I think given the quantum, at least what the numbers they've shared, uh, almost a lakh, one lakh crores of uh, hmm. a telecom CapEx, I think the fact is uh, people want to see the fruits of, of, of this uh, launch. And I think, uh, you know, and I'm sure it's going to do very well because it's time we actually got 4G. Uh, it's going to do a lot for the SME sector. It's going to do a lot for the corporate sector. So uh, if it indeed turns out to be a success, which a lot of people think it will, then I think the stock would definitely hit new highs. Massively definitely. rating is expected. Absolutely. But you know, we did get a sense of it in the last AGM. The stock yeah. really rallied, but then again fell off. So there is obviously a lot of pressure that comes up at the higher levels. No, it does. And I think even in terms of institutional ownership in the stock, I think has has definitely come off from what it used to be maybe seven to eight years ago. So you had you know bigger firms, Templeton, Janus, a lot of these guys, Fidelity, owning massive percentages of this of Reliance. And of course, given the liquidity and given how big the uh, uh, the company is. But I think uh, that has clearly slowed down. Uh, a lot of investors are underweight reliance. And I think, uh, depending on the launch and the success of the telecom venture, I think a lot of these guys would actually come back. Okay. I was just talking to Shachindra. The house deal seems to be that real corporate recovery is going to be about three to four quarters away. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you, from Q2, what are you really expecting? How are the markets poised? Because we have shed some weight before coming into this result season. So Correct. in a sense, the valuation earnings uh, gap has been narrowed. So what's yes. the sense that you get on both? You know, I think here's the thing, uh, and I, let me just answer that with an FI perspective as well. Because what we found is that, uh, and I think Sachin is absolutely right, at least another three quarters away from earnings actually recovering. And I think expectations that were built in with the NDA victory were way too high and way too optimistic to expect the Prime Minister and his team to actually turn around the economy within 15 or 18 months of, of being in office. So I think uh, that is going to remain, and I think that's starting to dawn upon investors now. Uh, from a from a FII perspective, I think the one question that I've been asked um, on almost regular basis in the last three to four months 
uh, whenever I've been overseas, Singapore and Hong Kong or, or, or other markets, is that when are we going to see the turnaround in earnings? And that's really the fundamental problem uh, foreign in, uh, investors are having. And hence, of course, they've been lightening up on India in the last uh, few months. But I think that is a fundamental question. I think when people are now starting to realize that things will take a lot, lot longer than what I think analysts and the, and the street was expecting and also what the media was expecting. Mm. So that's the good news, that it's starting to dawn upon people, it's going to take a lot longer. But having said that, I think from, a, from an FI perspective, mm. they still find China more attractive, valuations are even half, now. even now. Even now. But more so now, uh, oddly after, enough, after, after the, the correction, it's, even, it's, it's not trading at half the multiple. Of India, so. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, but there are some no-go areas for the markets. I mean, yes. from, from the result point of view, performance point of view, I'm <coughs> going to talk about the metal stocks. You know, yeah. they had been a bounce back because uh, you know of production cuts internationally and the general sense that they could have bottomed out. But yeah. look at the leverage for many of these companies. What's your house view on on the metal sector and the old economy behemoths on the Nifty? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. I think the fact is uh, we are not recommending people to get back in the sector as yet. I think. You have these uh, moments when you know Glencore is either going bust or Glencore is selling some mine, and that's going to flood the market. And China again is you know uh, slowing down. So I think there's too much news flow around the negativity, which which I think still continues. So we're not asking people to actually uh, look at metals. Having said that, in some of the no-go sectors, and I'm asked this question at the start of every mm. calendar year mm. by you know most of the media, that is this the, is this going to be the year for infra? Is this going to be the year for real estate? And I, still, I unfortunately have to say that that moment still hasn't arrived. It hasn't arrived. It has not arrived, no. So, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, ideas that are coming in yeah. uh, and the news flow that's coming in, that's the right word to put, yeah. on, on the ground up movement in power, in roads, yeah. uh, are you seeing a manifestation of that in actual uh, uh, company uh, uh, commentary right now? You or know, is it too early? It's interesting to bring that up because only three weeks ago we had our, um, we had a, uh, Infra day in our office, where we had uh, about 10 companies, of which three were BOT and seven were uh, EPC contractors for the infra projects. And what we found is 80% of the interest from investors mm. in terms of me uh, meeting these companies mm. was towards the EPC guys, you know, which, have, which have virtually no debt, mm. versus the BOT guys. So the interest, I think, is starting to come back for the EPC guys, and I think people do realize that putting, having put money and burnt their fingers with BOT guys, mm. uh, clearly the interest is now you know, with the EPC uh, companies. Fair what enough. the EPC companies did tell us is, year to date, about 45,000 crores of contracts have been awarded by the ministry and the NHAI. Okay, fair enough. I want to talk about telecom. Yeah. The TRI order of, uh, you know... Uh, call drops? Call drops. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering whether they'll have to pay for every subscriber <laughs> or will they get any money out of them? Let me know when I can sign up. <laughs> I'll, I'll be first in queue if, if that indeed becomes law. Yeah. yeah, but tell me something. I mean, uh, the, you know, we were hoping to see some bit of recovery, at least from the data side for telecom companies. Yeah. But now you have this. You yeah. have uh, 4G coming from Reliance Geo. Yeah. A lot of the uh, movement towards 4G happening. What's the core business looking? for the incumbents like Bharati Idea, et cetera? We've been underweight the telecom sector for over a year, and you know I think it's been a very good call by my analyst, Pumit Dugar. And I don't think that view's really changed. So I think uh, closer to the Reliance launch, uh, you will see further downside in some of these stocks. Mm. And I think uh, as people experience 4G in its entirety, because I'm, I'm hearing mixed things about the, the Bharati sure 4G launch, uh, but I guess Reliance's you know, product should be uh, significantly better than, than what we've seen so far. Okay. I want to ask you about pharma. That's been yeah. the darling of the market, the biggest outperformer uh, as a sector. Yes. But your view has been a little uh, sanguine about it, saying that you know, it's, it's not all good out there. Uh, are, are we ready for a fall? No, we're not ready for a fall. I think uh, that sector remains in a growth phase. In fact, uh, oddly enough, uh, about two years ago, a lot of the larger uh, brokerages actually got rid of the pharma analysts, which was kind of you know, ridiculous. And we were one of the few actually went and hired one. But the fact is that uh, pharma as a, as a sector, I think people may be, may be starting to have some fatigue with the large caps, but there's tremendous interest in the mid caps. Yeah. Because mid caps, whether it's a Strides Arcolab or Sequence Scientific or a Natco Pharma, these stocks have given you know, 5x returns or more in the last three to four years. So the interest level in mid-cap pharma is massive. Mm. And, and that's, can, where, that's where I put my money But many right of now. them have really run up also. Yes, I mean, yeah. you know, on a valuation metrics, yes. at a time when there's a large part of the market which is undervalued or, you know, below book value, that's right. versus a sector which is already run up, yeah. uh, you know, uh, by the percentage it has, would it still hold up? But, you know, that's the wrong way to look at it because I wouldn't say that because pharma is more expensive. So look at, you know, look at stocks in sectors which haven't really moved because that doesn't always work. 
And uh, like I said, in the case of the uh, of, of mid-cap pharma, yes, valuations are expensive, but there is massive demand even now. You know, core economy needs uh, time to recover, yeah. but uh, FII view on India is positive, uh, and we are expecting more money also coming in from domestic institutional investors. Yes. There's a lot of pension money coming in. What's your house view on where the Nifty and Sensex are going to be for calendar year end and uh, financial year end right now as we are poised? Yeah, I think uh, if I look at the Nifty by, um, actually, before I answer that, I think where are, we seeing, where are we seeing bulk of the money coming in? So the FIs, as we discussed earlier, have slowed down. And I think they're, they're looking at uh, emerging markets as a not so uh, happy place to be mm. at this point. Mm. So India, unfortunately, has been caught in that quagmire. Uh, and like I said earlier, that you know China seems more attractive from a pure valuation perspective. But the domestic mutual fund industry has taken in about $18 billion in the last 15 months. So that's that number is more than the last, the cumulative number for the last uh, five years. So domestic mutual funds, with the thanks to SIPs or just retail interest coming back in a massive way, uh, have been uh, flush with money. 60% of that money has come into mid-cap funds. Sure. So that's the reason you've seen the massive rally in mid-caps, including mid-cap pharma, as you discussed. But I think if that continues, and you know we don't see any reason why it should be, get derailed, uh, we can see the Sensex easily. Or, or let's let's go to the Nifty. The Nifty would be about 9,000 by. Uh, middle of next year is what that, that's our estimate. Okay, fair enough, Gautam. Great to have you Thank with you. us. Thank you so much for your insight. That's Gautam Trivedi. Uh, up next, we will be joined by Nitin Jain, the head of Relega Securities. We'll talk about the retail participation, which has not yet really come in, and also about the hot and happening IPO market. We come back with that. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching from the headquarters. We have the Redigay offices here in Noida in uh, the NCR region. Joining me now is Nitin Jain, the CEO of Redigay Securities. Nitin, thanks so much for joining us. Great to have you here. We spoke about the larger economy, about the equity markets. I'm going to talk to you about the, sec uh, the primary markets. And that's the hot and happening space because, you know, we've just had uh, Cafe Coffee Days, uh, IPO, well subscribed. Now mm -hmm. Indigo is coming in, of course, with uh, its IPO. What's the sense you're getting on the primary market front? No, so, so there was a prolonged slowdown for the last four or five years, and there hasn't been any IPOs. Now the season has started kicking in back, and you first saw the CCD IPO with Coffee Day. It kind of got oversubscribed, but there was a little lesser retail participation, and you have to give some time to retail because it will take some time. Uh, it's, it's been a long uh, one, and people need to see money on the table when you subscribe in the IPOs. So what we personally believe is that the IPO has to be uh, valued at a proper price. There should be some money left for the investor on the table. Mm. And that's where you saw some little interest in that. But now uh, the Big Bang IPO coming off Indigo, I think the, this will set the tone of the market, mm. and we'll see. OK, the uh, price band has changed uh, slightly over there. Uh, so uh, it, and after the current set of numbers that have been uh, shared, do you think, um, what is the sense you're getting on the retail interest or the, or the institutional interest in that one? So still the price uh, has not been uh, kind of placed pr properly. But yeah. what we personally believe is that if you look at uh, airline business is a little long tail business. So people who want to get into this kind of IPO, I think they'll have to have a view on on a longer time perspective, maybe about a five year time. Right. So this kind of uh, small change in valuation, I don't think it will impact the IPO. And it still looks like it's a good IPO. So I, I, we, we personally believe is that this will uh, pave the growth of market and people will come back. Okay. What about the government divestments rate? Uh, is that also going to be uh, something that is being getting increasingly pushed out rather than pushed in? It's not getting pushed out. It's kind of getting delayed. Mm. I think, to be very frank, the government is also waiting to see whether the markets will take it right or not. Yeah. And that's fair. But if you look at the corporate side, see, Indigo could have come a year back. Why they waited for one year? Because they also have confidence in market now. Okay. So that, that clearly shows the signs of recovery in the economy, that they see that when they come out with IPO at this point in time, people will take it positively. Okay, fair enough. I want to talk about you, uh, the retail participation. We were just talking about the great amount of money that's coming in through domestic institutional investors, okay. and DIIs have become the big movers and shakers. What's the composition like on the retail side? Has that also gone in for a change? Yeah. So I'll tell you what has happened is this, the retail is a little subdued as of now. Uh, there was a time when IPOs used to come in 2006, 2007 era, and people used to come in hordes, right? People have started coming back to the market. So if you see, last year there were about 15, uh, 1.5 uh, million 
demand accounts got added. This year, in the first six months, we have seen about a million demand accounts get added. Right? So there is there are a number of people who are coming to the market. But it's a little slower pace because the retail investor wants to build confidence in the market. Mm. Every time you have some one or two percent dropage in the market, they get a and little worried. And this August September volatility must have spooked a lot of people, right? Yeah, that's the whole reason. But this is an interesting figure which I can give you is that. Uh, in last two years, what we have seen from 2014-15 onwards, people have started, the entire retail spectrum has started moving out of uh, physical assets to financial assets. So there was a time in 10-11 when the phys physical assets allocation has gone up to as high as 85%. Now it has come down to almost about 50%. So it's now almost about 50-50% in financial assets and physical assets. Mm -hmm. When it comes to financial assets, people are still more towards uh, the bank deposits and the bonds. But the retail participation in equities is coming up now. People are, a lot of people are moving through the, the institution routes, mutual funds and all uh, the schemes. But, but direct equity would, I think, would take some more time. Okay. Uh, what sense are you getting from uh, the HNI community? Because there's been a composition change over there as well. Uh, you know, with a lot of, uh, and you were telling me, there's a lot of younger HNIs, a new breed of HNIs has come in. Of course, a lot of dollar millionaires have appeared from the entire e-commerce and the startup space. What's the sense that you're getting there? Yeah. So, so there is a composition, in, a change of composition in, in, in retail investor. So. I, I'll again go back a decade back or maybe seven, six, six, seven years back and there were a lot of traders. So we had about 400 branches and they used to be filled up with all day traders. Now it's not there. The working customer is not there at all in entire BFSI sector today, right? People are more tax savvy. They sit at homes and they do it. Now you have a lot of younger investors which are getting into the investment segment. Now you see people 25 years age. That's the new HNI which we call, right? Because. Uh, the income levels of India in, in India has grown up. The new sectors which has opened up, which are paying more. And that's where we are seeing young aged investors coming into the markets. And we see a lot of development happening in the online space, mm. uh, especially in the mobile space. So like we, we, all, we have a mobile platform and we are going to launch very soon our, uh, the next version of mobile platform. Every day we see more number of people coming to the mobile platform. And that's where we see the technology will change, will drive this business in a very different manner, <coughs> which most of the uh, I think industry is not realizing, right? But we personally believe, uh, believe okay. that this will... Uh, if anything, 2015, uh, last question, Anitin, if anything this year has been a year for domestic institutional investors. I mean, the balance has shifted and how. We're seeing a lot of pension money get into the system over the next three, four months. Uh, Diwali is a period of high sentiment boost. Uh, what is the sense that you're getting for the fag end of this year? After this middling, uh, you know, uh, period of volatility, do you think the the rest of the year is going to be much better and more secular. Definitely, we are looking at uh, positive for next two quarters, but we still believe that earnings have not been positive. It'll take some more time, maybe about a couple of quarter, and we see entire thing gets uh, getting picking up from somewhere from the fourth quarter onwards, not before that. Mm. A, a slow, a, a slow momentum is there, but the kind of speed you really want to see is not there in the market. Okay. That will take some time. So slow and steady, will it win in the race? We'll have to see sure, uh, how it goes. Nitin, thanks so much for joining Thank us. You. Well, that's a wrap uh, from uh, from the headquarters here at Religay. You've got some great insights, some great uh, ideas on which way uh, experts are calling this market and what are the trends that you are seeing on the ground. Thanks so much for joining us. Goodbye.